Okay, so I'd, I'd like to start. Um, I'd like to, to welcome you all to the launch of our Buying Social Justice, Equality and Diversity Toolkit. So I'm Professor Tessa Wright and I've been working on this project with my colleagues for um, two years now. So this is a, an exciting moment for us to, to have got to this stage. Um, so what I will um, do is just explain to you uh, what, how, how the morning is going to run. Um, so I'll introduce briefly the research team and the research aims. Uh, and between us, we'll talk a little bit about the, the methods that, that we used for the research um, and some of the key findings. Uh, then we'll introduce the toolkit. So we have Frances McAndrew here who um, wrote the toolkit for us. So she'll go, she's going to introduce it to you and, and show you how it works. We then have a great team of panellists to uh, respond to the toolkit. We have um, somebody, we have, we have Chris Oswald from the EHRC and uh, Abigail Hump from the TUC, as well as four of our case study uh, participants. So you'll be able to um, hear from them about their own case studies, um, as, as well as the toolkit. And also there'll be an opportunity for uh, questions and answers um, after a short break. So we're very excited that um, there will be time for questions and um, we, we've got a, a great um audience here of, of including some of the people who participated in the research and, and others. So we're hoping that you'll have some interesting questions for us. Um, I should say, please use the Q&A to, to put your questions in and we'll we'll pick those up um, in the sort of second half of the session and uh, answer those there. So that that'll be the way for uh, we'll use for the for the questions and answers. So the research aims, so we were interested in, we were, we were very aware that there is uh, legislation and policy on social value and community benefits and how these can be incorporated into public sector purchasing. But we were interested in a particular aspect of equality and diversity and whether this, to, to what extent really, this was being used across the public sector. Um, and we chose to focus on local authorities, housing associations and universities uh, with a particular emphasis on construction works projects, which are obviously kind of high value purchases by the public sector. Um, so we did, we've done, a, um, Katerina will talk you through the, the methods in a moment, but we were interested in how this was being put into practice in the different countries of England, Wales and Scotland, because the, both the legal frameworks and also the policy kind of emphasis is different in each country. And we wanted to, uh, where there was a gap, to produce some guidance and recommendations for how people could um, effectively incorporate equality and diversity into their procurement practices. Um, and that's obviously what we're um, delighted to be doing today is to introducing our, our toolkit. Um, so the team is, is led by myself. Uh, we have Professor Hazel Conley here, who you will um, see later on as she chairs the uh, Q&A sessions. So um, Hazel's from the University of the West of England. Um, we have uh, Dr. Katerina Sarter, who is from the University of Warwick, who's going to talk to you a little bit in a moment about the methods that we used. And we have Dr. Joyce Mamode, who has been the um, postdoctoral research associate uh, based here at Queen Mary, who's um, kind of done everything, really. It's been a <laughs> hugely, uh, huge, hugely important um, mem member of the team. Um, so we also, we've been very, very lucky to be supported by a project advisory board made up of both academic and practitioner experts um, in the field. And we do have two of our uh, project advisory board members, uh, Chris Oswald from the EHRC and uh, Abigail uh, Hunt from the TUC uh, talking today. But there've been many other members of our project advisory board who've been extremely helpful at all stages of the research. And, and we're very grateful to have had their, had their input. I'm going to now pass on to um, uh, Dr. Katerina Sarto, who will tell us tell you all a little bit about the methods. Yeah, thank you. As you've already heard, the project aimed to gain insights into social procurement in Great Britain and took a comparative outlook to look at England, Scotland and Wales more particularly. And this meant that uh, in the first stage, um, it was about understanding the specific contracts in the three countries and to understand how the context differs. In a second step, we then looked at the implementation and we did that in two ways. We first wanted to gain an overview and take stock of what's happening on the ground. 
And then the second step was to gain in-depth insight into procurement practices in organizations that can be described as good practice examples and to identify particularly features that facilitate this good practice. And to achieve these aims, we've combined a range of different methods. We started with an international literature review and then moved to um, exploring the specific context in England, Scotland and Wales, which included examining public policies in the three countries as a first step to gain understand the background and the policy environment in the three nations and identify similarities and differences. To gain further understanding of public procurement policies and practices and how employment equality features therein, we then conducted semi-structured interviews with experts on procurement and equality in England, Scotland and Wales. Overall, we conducted over 30 interviews with key experts and this included experts who work on the policy side of public procurement, so individuals who shape public procurement, representatives of commissioning and contracting organizations, equality experts who also engaged with procurement, and civil society organizations. And these interviews were crucial for identifying common threats and features and to understand the different approaches in the three countries. They also provided a crucial background for the following steps of the analysis, the exploration of how this policy context is put into practice. And here we have a first step of conducting a survey with procurement officers. So those people that are involved in the procurement practice, and we focus specifically on the three areas that we've already heard. So local authorities, housing associations, and higher education institutions. And the idea here was really to get an idea of the lay of the land and to understand to what extent and how equality objectives are included in public procurement practices across the three countries, what the drivers are, and how respondents perceive the outcomes of the actions taken. It also gave an indication of the spread of the use of public procurement to promote e employment equality. By its nature, a survey cannot give a detailed and in-depth reflection of the specific experiences and practices in organization, and that's why we turn to case studies. And these case studies were a way to look at the implementation more in detail and particularly understand the features that helped the successful implementation. And to do so, we looked at organizations that have been described as uh, good practice examples and seek to understand how their approach was considering social procurement in terms of procurement practices, in terms of monitoring and reporting practices. And the case studies were selected based on recommendations and examples given in interview interviews and through a project advisory board which has already been mentioned and comprise organizations from England, Scotland and Wales and local authorities, as well as housing associations, the university and to infrastructure projects. And you will hear from some of our case study organizations a bit later today. Following that, we conducted uh, collaborative workshops in the three countries and these workshops brought together individuals working on the policy side, practitioners from different organizations and other stakeholders. And the aim was really twofold. On the one hand, it was an opportunity for discussing preliminary findings of a project with people involved in procurement policy and practice. But secondly, the workshops also created an opportunity for practitioners from very diff different backgrounds to exchange their experiences and practices, identify common threats and their challenges, and also share good practices across the organizations, which then fed back into our project. And I know that you're probably all going to be uh, really interested in hearing what we found out using these methods. And therefore, I will now hand over to uh, Dr. Joyce Marmot, who will give an outline of the findings. Thank you, Katerina. So, 
based on all that data that we gathered from that survey uh, of procurement specialists, the interviews with equality and procurement specialists and the nine case study organisations that we looked at, we identified six good practice principles that support the inclusion of equality and social justice outcomes in public procurement. We have lots of other findings as well, but these are the key ones we want to focus on today. So the first of our good practice principles is collaboration and partnership working. And when we talk about that, we're talking about both internally and externally to the organization. So internally, collaboration and partnership between different teams, such as the procurement team, equality teams within organizations, teams who are focused on sustainability, people also within the procurement function, looking at the different stages of procurement. So good practice uh, we've identified is to have good systems and effective systems to enable collaboration between all these groups within the organization. Equally important is external collaboration. So for example, sharing good practice across um, networks, um, that can help reduce workload because the work can be shared uh, in terms of complex drafting of, of requirements, for example. So that can be sector based, it can be um, networking and collaboration across professional groups, but also external collaboration with other organisations such as trade unions and civil society organisations and with local community groups and the local community itself. So we found particularly our expert interviewees talked about how trade unions can be really valuable as the eyes and ears on the ground in terms of seeing what's actually being delivered and whether whether people are actually living up to the commitments that they've signed up to do in terms of good work or fair work or commitments to equality charters and, and the like. Um, civil society organisations as well can help provide a bridge between the aspirations that uh, commissioning organisations might have in terms of introducing greater diversity in a workforce and the reality of actually trying to achieve it. Transparent engagement with suppliers we found to be really important. This principle came out really strongly that open and transparent engagement really helped to create a shared objective that both sides could, could work to together. And it kind of echoes the first good, good practice principle as well, that importance of talking and collaborating this time across the organisational boundaries with the suppliers as well as with, with um, interested stakeholders. So we found things like meet the buyer events, webinars through the working uh, in terms of pre-procurement activities, through actually working with suppliers once the procurement has taken place were really, really important factors to, to achieving good practice. Strategic alignment is also important. So by that, we're meaning across, across sectors. So in this case, the public sector, across the sectors within that as well. So for example, between local authorities, national policies such as those that we that, that have, been, have been introduced in Scotland and Wales are really important for helping to achieve that strategic alignment across sort of broader broader sort of groups, groupings, but also within organisations, strategic alignment's really important. It's about having consistency and prioritising equality and social justice. And we talk a lot about it, about this consistency running through activities like a golden thread, through the strategies in an organisation, the business plans and the procurement strategies, and also through to delivery. That leads to our fourth um, good practice principle, which is consistency of approach. That's really important. It's about having that consistency that helps people understand what it is that they're they're being asked to deliver and that pulls people together under under a common common goal and pulling in the right direction. So that's about consistency in definitions, criteria, measurement, and data collection. And it helps clarity and it helps delivery. For example, we found lack of clarity, particularly on the supplier side, can, can feed a cynicism when people aren't necessarily initially bought into equality and social justice outcomes. Resourcing, of course, we can't go without talking about resourcing. It's a, it's a big issue in the public sector at the moment. And um, it's essential in terms of the resourcing of the equality functions, 
community engagement functions, as well as the procurement functions. And all three of those, those functions within the public sector are, as I'm sure lots of us know, under a lot of pressure at the moment because, um, because of the shortage of, of public funds. So what we what we found and what we found was a really good practice um, thing to focus on was the need for that resourcing not to be uh, sacrificed necessarily that there are that there are issues that that result from that. And finally, senior leadership and political commitment, absolutely crucial, particularly evident in our case study um, data, was this this important uh, emphasis on organisations who started off with a political commitment to improving um, social justice outcomes for their communities, whether that meant residents, tenants, students in a university or broader residents within a city or a region or even along a transport route that was really really important the, the the that idea of the golden thread but running right from the top of an organization and then running through the organization um, that was really really important and i think links all those six good practice principles together so um that's a very brief whistle top tour of our key research findings obviously we could talk for hours about them um, but I will hand over to Tessa who will talk a bit more about our outputs where you can read more of more of what we found in more detail yeah, thank you very much Joyce yes there, there, there will be a lot more outputs um, available on our project website so we've we've been doing a blog throughout the project uh, mostly written by us but also some external um, contributions, uh, particularly from the project advisory board. So, so do have a look at that. Um, we're working now on completing a, a report on the findings, uh, which underpins what's gone into the toolkit, and that will be available on our website, um, hopefully by the end of the month. The good practice case studies are available on the website. Uh, those are longer versions that there's shorter versions in the toolkit, as you'll see in a moment, but there are the full versions on our website. Um, we're working on academic papers, um, so those will be uh, you know, available once they come out. Um, and obviously what we're launching today is the toolkit. So um, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Francis McAndrew from Goss Consultancy, who uh, wrote the toolkit for us based on an enormous amount of not very well ordered information that we gave her um, from the research findings. Um, and then we sort of she she produced drafts and, and, and we interfered. And, um, you know, it's been a it's been a very interactive process, but but very enjoyable nonetheless. Um, and I should say that. Uh, we were very lucky to have um, Frances agree to do it because I know she, she's one of the people that I've been talking to over many years about the importance of uh, public procurement as a kind of a lever, a mechanism for um, integrating equality and diversity into organisational practice. And uh, Frances has got a lot of experience of this over many years in, in many different organisations. Um, so just before I introduce uh, Frances, I just wanted to um, thank Research retold, retold who've designed the toolkit for us. And I think um, Mihaela uh, from Research Retold is joining the call today. So I'd just like to thank Mihaela and her team for producing what I think is a very nice looking uh, toolkit, which I hope you will agree. Um, so over to you, Francis, if you just want to briefly introduce yourself while I'm um, opening up the toolkit um, and, and sure. share. Thanks. Thanks, Tessa, and thank you to the team at QM, uh, Queen Mary University, um, and all of the other project team. It's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, I suppose it's uh, maybe a little bit useful just to explain why I would be so keen to write this toolkit. Um, and mainly it comes from having had the luxury, the pleasure, the honour to work in anything and everything to do with equality, diversity and social justice for the last 25 years. Um, and I've spent time in the voluntary sector. So I've been on the kind of receiving end of community engagement, but I've also worked at the Princess Trust where I was employed to help minority businesses, uh, especially disabled businesses start up. So I've seen this from the angle of, of businesses trying to bid for work. Um, I've then spent time in the public sector. So I've worked 
for an organisation that doesn't exist anymore, but did some phenomenal work in London, including the bid for the Olympic Games, which was called the London Development Agency, whose sole remit really was to commission work. Uh, and that was my first job in the public sector. So as an equality and diversity manager, as we were called at the time, I've also had the pleasure of working for the mayor of London, writing uh, Sadiq Khan's diversity strategy. Uh, and that was really focused on all of the social justice issues that might then filter through to all of his other strategies, including the work I then went on to deliver at Transport for London. Um, and finally, I've spent some time now working globally in the private sector. So looking at this whole issue from what's it like to have to bid back to the public sector uh, and deliver on those wonderful contracts that I used to help write the equality clauses for. So I feel like I've had a, a really uh, enjoyable time looking at this issue from, from every angle. Um, so it, it really combines my passions of social justice and equality, um, the public sector equality duty and procurement. And also I've managed, for those of you who have ever uh, met me or worked with me, to actually also sneak in equality impact assessments as well. Something that I am known for being quite excited about, which, yeah, probably says too much about me. Uh, and also some uh, details on minority businesses, which hopefully you'll see in the brilliant toolkit that I say brilliant as in the design. Uh, I'll let you all be the judge of the content. I hope you find it useful. But yeah, here it is in its shiny glory. Uh, and Tess has kindly demonstrated it for me because I don't think anyone would trust me to talk and present this at the same time. Uh, one of the things we did want to highlight is it's interactive as well. So you'll be able to play with it once you get downloaded a copy but yeah if if tessa shows us now that if, if you want to use the the orange buttons at the bottom they'll just take you through a linear document as you would normally but there is also a number of other functions so if you take this page for example um at the bottom there are the arrows but at the top left you'll see a home button and you use that on any page to go back to this page so if you've been jumping around the document and aren't sure where you've got to, just use this home button to go back to the beginning. Um, there are also links within the document that you can follow to some of the original documents we use, the research. And then you've also got these tabs at the top, which many of you will have used before, but the tabs keep you sort of on the main sections and you can just jump between them because we hope that while you may read it all in one go, um, you might more uh, often use it as a, as a document to refer back to at various stages of your procurement journeys. So yeah, just a little bit of uh, uh, you know a heads up on that level of, of interactivity. Um, as sad as this is for me to say, you know, if you only read one page, which I thoroughly understand how busy you all are, then I'd recommend that it's this page, it's page two because it really hones in on those two key principles, one being the the, the golden thread, uh, you could call it the red thread or hard wiring or mainstreaming, call it what you will, but it's this basic idea that it's never too soon to think about how equality and social justice are relevant to the procurement process. And it has a resonance and a relevance throughout um, in different ways, and hopefully we'll bring those to life for you now. Um, but yeah, it also uh, is a reminder of those principles that Joyce just uh, beautifully illustrated and that have shone through in the research and case studies uh, that have gone into this toolkit. And I would just share a couple of reflections on the principles. I think I don't want to go over them again. They've been really clearly explained. But for me, um, the collaboration and partnership working has been so crucial throughout my career. I've had that opportunity to, for example, at TFL, work with the Independent Disability Advisory Group, a group of disabled people paid for their time and input and expertise on anything and everything that has been uh, procured, commissioned at various stages. Um, and also with trade unions, um, maybe uh, slightly biased, but as a former shop steward, but they are also sources of real rich insights on equality issues, social justice issues. 
And of course, it goes without saying that the communities that we're all there to serve have real uh, insider knowledge, if you like, on what would work for their community. And I saw that very clearly when I worked for the mayor and we engaged with communities across London on what they thought would be the most important issues. And in fact, what they thought some of the solutions should be, especially when it came to commissioning and procuring work. And again, I would just highlight, you won't be surprised that resourcing it really is a key point. I've had, as I mentioned, 25 years working in the sector, and I don't think today I've ever had enough time to thoroughly do the procurement journey justice as a head of equality, an equality manager, a director, you name it, whatever my job was. I always felt like it was the... Uh, the slightly um, poor cousin in the relationship I had with very many different departments, but still gave it as much time and energy and enthusiasm as I could, because I could see how important it was. So yeah, that's just uh, some reflections. And sorry, finally, I wanted to mention, in terms of consistency, there is an awful lot going on in and across the public sector um, that really, if you're not involved with, try and tap into. So for example, Highways England have been doing some phenomenal work to try and bring my old sector of transport um, together to look at when we are procuring, how can we be really helpful to suppliers by even just agreeing what the definition of a minority business is or how to collect diversity data. Some of these things that can speed us all up and spend more time on the quality of the projects than on the minutiae of the delivery. So yeah, just some of my reflections on those key principles as one of uh, your fellow practitioners. So now I'm gonna try and give you some key takeaways from each of the sections. You'll see hopefully that we've laid it out in a linear fashion as one might hope to go through a procurement process from pre preparing to writing the spec, selecting suppliers, et cetera. And I just thought it might help to, to reflect on what the points that really stood out to me were. So if we start with, for example, preparing to procure, um, I think it's almost, um, it's almost too late in this sense. Uh, uh, Joyce mentioned the strategic alignment. As many of you will know, you know, at the point of going to think about procurement, it's almost too late to start to think about how you embed equality and social justice. But, you know, it's thinking about all the ways in which it should have already been present in a project description, in a, um, a strategy, in a budget you know, heaven forbid, there was some money there to do this. So, yeah, I think, but, you know, when you are preparing to procure, it's a question of building that solid business case. And during that process, really giving yourself time uh, to think about how do you actually um, kind of consider in all aspects, how does equality and social justice seem relevant? Um, we know that there can be a kind of uh, a nod to the, has every supplier got a diversity policy? Well, hopefully because you're here and you're interested, you can see already it's much more than that. And there are many other ways when you're building your business case to look at how relevant uh, equality and social justice is. And what I've suggested, uh, no surprise, is that the tool that we've used in greater or lesser degrees across the public sector over the last 20 years, an impact assessment, an impact review, call it what you will, but a, a process of going through, looking at the evidence, consultation, uh, looking at potential negative impacts of any business case and looking at the opportunities to have a bigger impact, a positive impact, will stand you in good stead when it comes to having those conversations with suppliers, when it comes to building the spec. You know, they're the things that, you know, will really give you a solid foundation and I just wanted to mention a couple of things from the toolkit one is you know there's a new tool called geostat which if I'd had when I was doing more impact assessments I think it would have saved me hours there are also other tools coming online that help you build the evidence base that help you understand the differential impacts of what could be seemingly neutral actions building a housing estate building a community estate whatever the construction project is the tools will show you how these things starting out on an uneven playing field really matters. And also there is some great stuff in the case studies in this chapter coming from people like our wonderful speakers that's gonna come on later, Harker in Poplar, where they've been doing listening exercises with communities 
that have then really informed work, for example, on the, the Teviot estate. So there are some, you know, really choice case studies that I would immediately just borrow with pride the ideas they've got. I'm sure that's why they've shared them. And also the Glasgow City Region Deal, who've been compiling community wish lists so that you can actually use what you know you already know when it comes to procuring you've already done a lot of that background work so some great case studies there in that building a solid business case with an eqia preparing to procure i probably should have put a timer on when i started talking i'm going to speed up tessa just to keep all the panel's anxieties at bay um writing the specification um it's really about getting the requirements right and I would just nod to a couple of takeaways. It's about what you procure, obviously, thinking about things like outcomes. Have we got anything in there about increasing satisfaction of women using various different community facilities, for example, outputs, affordable uh, childcare, apprenticeships, but it could also be about inputs that you need in the requirements like design standards. But it's not just about thinking about what you're procuring. There's also an opportunity here to think about who delivers the piece and their workforce and adopting fairer working practices, voluntary code, something I'm sure our colleagues at High Speed 2 will be able to illuminate much better than I can. Then you get the selecting supplier stage, where I would just say there are really two key takeaways. The one for me has been about engaging with suppliers um, and helping them to understand this whole area if they're not experts in equality? Is there an opportunity to upskill them or even set up innovative partnerships? And on this page, you'll see there's the social partnership portal where those in business who want to bid for work can be matched up or other voluntary sector bodies with other suppliers to, to form a really solid bid. Um, but also, as I'd be doing my former role a disservice if I didn't say harnessing the skills and insights of minority businesses at this point. Um, but the public sector has a real duty here to make that possible by maybe smaller lots or decent timelines. Um, so, yeah, um, then it gets to the tendering bit. I think the key opportunity here is to really look at those award criteria, thinking about within the constraints of the legislation and the toolkit goes into those. So don't worry if there are any procurement officers on the call starting to have butterflies, you know, within the legislative requirements, there's still opportunities for the criteria to reflect equality and social justice issues, especially when we remember that value for money doesn't mean cheapest um, and that equality is often part of quality. And I hope we're going to hear from our colleagues in Wales Housing Association about how they've involved experts and actually as equality experts in actually assessing some of the bids from suppliers. Finally, the bit that often gets least time and actually can have the most impact is what happens at the end. You know, the so what bit. We've spent hours, eons time procuring, supplying, uh, getting the right suppliers, but actually how are we managing the contract? How are we having those conversations? How are we building relationships that let a supplier tell us things are not working? You know, there are problems. How do we have that honest relationship? And hopefully uh, Osito from High Speed 2 may have something to say about the amazing work that High Speed 2 have been doing on building relationships with their suppliers. I know that because I used to work for one of the suppliers. Um, finally, just to sort of sort of round up really, the world of equality, diversity, inclusion and social justice, as I've been in for 25 years, is unrecognisable today from 25 years ago. And it's grown exponentially in the last two to five years. But I just say we have to be cautious about any of those quick fixes, exciting, sexy initiatives that, that are getting thrown our way, because hopefully, as the toolkit shows, more often than not, it's about treating equality and social justice as a serious business or public sector issue and about putting in the work. Thank you, Tessa. Thank you very much, Francis. That was a great uh, introduction to the toolkit. Um, and fortunately, the interactivity seemed to work, so, so that's good. Um, just to say that it is now available on our website. Uh, you do have to put in your name and an email address in order to download it. And that's because we're very interested in 
uh, seeing what people think about the toolkit itself and, and capturing some feedback. So uh, we will have your emails and we'll no doubt um, contact you and, and ask you what you thought of it. So that's part of our kind of ongoing um, engagement with people who are using it. So what I'd like to do now is I will introduce, um, we have a, a panel who are going to talk a, a, about the kind of general issues and, and also the toolkit. So I will introduce uh, Chris Oswald from the Equality and Hu Human Rights Commission first, um, and I shall go back to the other slides while uh, Chris is, is talking to us. So uh, welcome, Chris. Thanks very much, Tessa, and thanks very much to Tessa, Catalina, Joyce and Francis for the really helpful framing of the document. I'm speaking to you from Edinburgh. Uh, it's rather dark here, as you can probably tell. We're just about to have a major storm. Um, so fingers crossed that we'll be here tomorrow. Um, just on something that Francis said just at the end, which I thought was really interesting and echoes something I've been seeing for so long, this thing about equality as quality. Um, and I, I would love, I'm, similarly to Francis, I've been in this game for quite a long time. I would love the point at some point where we actually talk about a failure to provide kosher food or um, um, halal food in a social care situation wouldn't be an equality failure, it would be a quality failure. The failure to provide a signer for somebody who's deaf um, is not an equality failure, it's also a quality failure as well. And when we move towards that, I think we'll be much happier. When the Commission first approached um, these issues, particularly around regeneration, the problem that we identified was that far too many projects paid no attention to equality at all. So we see funding being given out, major tranches of funding being given out, um, with little or no thought about equality. At best, um, often in procurement, we would see a commitment to eliminate discrimination, you know, a risk management thing. Are these people likely to discriminate? Are they likely to get us into trouble? Um, far too rarely did we see a focus on the other two aims of the duty, the advancement of equality of opportunity and the fostering of good community relations. And it's the second one, the advancement of equality of opportunity that we really want to see, um, the centrality of procurement to regeneration. Um, it's very positive, but it's, it, it's been problematic both for the commission and also for the researchers, given that, even inside the three nations that we're looking at, we have differences in equality law and we have differences in procurement law. Um, very positively, the Welsh government has just introduced the Social Partnership and Public Procurement Act, um, which starts to put conditions um, on major contracts, particularly in construction. And it's about increasing the workforce um, particularly women, ethnic minorities, disabled people, people from the most deprived communities, so that they are able to share in the benefit of this investment as employees. Um, there's a huge amount of money going into this and under the levelling up programme, £4.8 billion. Pounds. Um, in Scotland and Wales, the combined city-region deals reach something like £120 million, £120 billion pounds and are projected to create 120,000 jobs. Now we want to see more of these jobs going to the people who are seriously underrepresented in the sectors. And we think that procurement is a very uh, powerful way of doing that, of having equality as KPIs inside the contracts that you can hold contractors to account. That equality isn't just something that's an afterthought um, in creating 3,000 apprenticeships we want to know how many women, how many ethnic minorities, how many disabled people are also benefiting from those apprenticeships or employment. I just wanted to pick out one area. Um, the Commission's been doing a lot of work with combined authorities and city region deals um, across the country. One area which particularly worries me is the digital industry. We are putting so much money into digital infrastructure through levelling up, through city region deals. The digital industry remains 75% male. There's a 22% pay gap, gender pay gap. Um, we also see women segregated into the backrooms functions, not earning the bonuses that the guys are doing. And we are putting billions of pounds of public money into these industries and asking little or nothing in return. So looking forward, I would like to see, um, and what we've been working with public bodies to do is to get 
fair work principles, real living wage, zero hour contracts, flexible work, introduced as contractual um, certainties, but also to see stretching targets for improvements about the proportion of women as apprenticeships or as employees. Employers setting targets, um, tenderers, contractors setting targets, which are monitored by um, the, con the contract holder going forward. There's not enough time to tell you what I think about procurement and equality, but I think there's massive potential, absolutely massive potential. One thing I have recognized very clearly that the procurement profession needs greater resourcing. There are simply not enough people with this expertise. And one of the things which the research highlights is that whilst there's a lot of work on tendering, there's very little work on monitoring. And unless we hold people to account, we will not get the um, desired impact that we want. Um, the other thing is just simply, and it's a real practical problem, is that policy and procurement people don't speak to each other until it's too late. And I really want to see procurement people engaged at the earliest possible stages of contract, uh, uh, of development of proposals, which will lead to external contracting. Lots of stuff. There's so much positive stuff in this. I've actually already stolen some of it, as was suggested, I think, by Francis, I um, blame you, and used it with Liverpool Combined Authority last week and West Yorkshire this week. It's gone down really well, and I'd encourage anybody here to, to spread the word and to use it yourselves. In closing, I started this journey with policy and procurement about seven years ago, and I know that Barbara uh, Morton and Joe Mitchell are on the call today. And I'd just like to express a personal thanks to them to helping me unpick um, both the complexity of procurement, but also its potential. And I think that's the thing that what we have today is a tool which starts to help you realize that potential. So thanks, Tessa. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Joyce. And thanks, Katerina and the broader team. It's been a real joy working with you. And I think there's lots of stuff we can do from now, taking it forward. Work's just begun. Lovely, Chris. Thank you very much. It's uh, really nice to hear that and, and glad to hear you already been using it out there with people. So fantastic. Um, so thank you. So uh, let's move on to um, Asita Madhu from High Speed 2, who's going to tell us a little bit about um, what, what, what they've been doing in relation to equality and procurement. Thanks, Tessa. Um, I hope you can all hear me well, well enough. Um, it seems several months ago, I think it was before the summer break, that we um, were approached by Tessa um, and Joyce with regards to what HS2 are doing in this area. And some of you may already know that we probably started this journey, I would say, seven years ago, since much longer than that, around about 2016. Um, and initially, we really started to look at what already is happening in public procurement particularly on big infrastructure programs. So one of the best examples we had at the time was the Olympic. Um, Francis McAndrew, you mentioned in your sort of presentation, the LDA and the work they've done there. Um, and it was really focused on supplier diversity. And that was the way it was themed. And it's really how you leverage more for minority and SME businesses through um, public procurement. And so, we thought to ourselves, you know, how far can we take this? How can we build a more robust system that actually delivers the very thing we want across the HS2 program and also within the HS2 corporate services? So in terms of the structure of HS2, when we talk about the HS2 program, we're talking about actually all the boots on the ground, the contractors and suppliers working with HS2. Um, and the corporate center is the HS2 Limited. It's the sort of that direct intake of employees where we do the H, sort of HR functions and all the sort of central functions to support the business. Um, and really my role when I joined HS2 in 2016 was to do that very thing, which is to establish and develop the sort of toolkit that would be across the whole of the program. And I would say to date, it's worked really, really effectively for us. Um, but I guess the central question is really, what are the sort of important factors for us to achieve equality of outcomes through procurement and also tendering? Because of course, the procurement is the initial stage, but of course, it's when you, the tenders come in that the real work begins, as I, be, as I believe. 
Um, so one of the initial thing, and I think perhaps the most important thing, is to really have a collective agreement on what you want to achieve as an organization. So one of the central things I did was to say, actually, if we're going to be able to move forward on this, who are the key internal stakeholders that need to be brought on board? Um, and how would they invest in the tools and the outcomes we want to achieve by having this toolkit? And so clearly talking to the procurement team was a, a key factor in this, but also through our senior leadership and the exec as well, talking to our executive team and saying, actually, what's the business case for wanting this to work for us? I would say 80% of the work we do within Take Us To through the corporate center is around engaging and also procuring services and contracts across the board. And the second part to that is obviously doing the governance and assurance. So we need to assure ourselves that those contractors are supplying to the level and to the quality standard that we expect throughout the life cycle of the contract. So it really made sense. It wasn't really a hard sell to the executive um, and our senior leadership as to why we need to develop a tool that was effective and a tool that can be used by our procurement team in order to deliver this. So having done that, the next thing is to actually do a deep dive exercise to really identify what the toolkit will do and deliver for us. So what happens at this process is really the toolkit is developed to such an extent that anybody who is doing a piece of procurement within HS2 doesn't need to come to me initially. The toolkit does a filter by identifying whether there's impact on diverse groups whether there's impact on people more generally, and whether the service in itself warrants us actually using this to, uh, to build the diversity requirements. So some of the questions we want as part of the tendering process, but also some of the questions we want upfront in pre-qualifying um, pre suppliers to work with HS2. So the toolkit provides that sort of filter and assurance and where we've got some identification that there is a high or medium impact, then it's for the procurement lead to be in a position to say, actually, we need to develop robust questions in order then to follow through with um, the tendering process. Um, so in two simple stages, one is the pre qualification We set compliance-based questions. And some of those compliance-based questions look at things around whether potential suppliers um, have got any sort of issues at that initial stage. So has there been a compliance notice by Equality and Human Rights Commissions, for example, um, whether there's been any sort of compliance notice served or whether there's been any discrimination cases they've had with the tribunal. So we're in a position to actually do a lot of filtering out. And we've had made decisions which have been difficult for us to actually not go forward with a potential supplier because they've not addressed those areas um, as part of the process in the, in, the, in the first couple of years. So if they've not done anything at all in the first couple of years, we then need to make sure we remove them as part of that process initially. Um, but what happens beyond the tendering is important for us. So we've had really successful way of managing the tendering process. Market engagement was key. So understanding what you want from your suppliers and engaging them early enough to understand what the equality, diversity, inclusion requirements are. So it goes beyond policy. It's things around income and, and, and impact. You know, what impact do we want to make around equality, diversity, and inclusion? And some of those impacts are around, for example, are those companies that are working with HS2 going to be accredited? So there's an equality standard, which is almost like a, um, an audit in itself. Are they going to be delivering training that's relevant in this area around equality, diversity, and inclusion? both in the office and on site, because it's much more difficult to do this sort of training on a construction site. How is their recruitment? Is it robust? Is it inclusive? And what improvements can they make to their recruitment process to break down barriers that typically include minorities entering um, the, the, the workforce? So all of these drivers are really key for us to have a real key performance at the end of um, the, the process. And I would say just a couple of more points, I'm conscious of time as well. It's 
in my experience, the best suppliers we work with would do really well in demonstrating the impact around this area of work are those that are most engaged, those who collaborate with us, those who are willing to learn, and also get their senior leaders on board. Um, so the best performing suppliers we have that works with us are those who understand that their end journey involves all the key stakeholders to be part of this. And also the key thing is uh, as well is the barriers of entry for suppliers. Every supplier that we work at is different scale and size. So we work with obviously multinationals right through to more national operators like the Kias and Balfour BTs. But they all have different challenges around diversity and inclusion and all, all have different understanding around their procurement process and tendering. But the most important thing is the barriers of entry. Understanding that to work with HS2, we expect you to be at this level. And to go beyond that level, we can assist you. So there's lots of capacity building that we do to really assist suppliers once they're working with us to be even better than they are in this area. Um, and that barriers of entry has been really a game changer for us. So what we're starting to see is a ripple effect where it's not just the HS2 program, that they're delivering and doing work on EDI, but it's also at parent company level. So how are they taking lessons from the projects to replicate at their sort of parent company level? Um, and some of the indicators we're seeing is a higher proportion of representation in terms of the workforce, particularly women and ethnic minority, a higher number of spend with those suppliers, so previously, where they've not been able to win contracts, particularly public contracts um, like HS2, they've been able to do that because to navigate through the tendering and, and procurement process has been made much easier. There's smaller work packages. There is more sort of education and capacity building to enable them to operate. So we're seeing the spend go up year on year for women-owned businesses and for ethnic minority-owned businesses. So that's a real positive of what we've seen through this process. Um, and certainly it, it gives us encouragement in going forward, particularly with some of our smaller suppliers who are minority owned, to give them confidence that they can actually do more future work with HS2 and be in a position to basically be supported through that process. Um, so I'll leave it there. Um, and just in case there's a question at the end, because I'm conscious of other panel members wanting to contribute. Lovely. Thanks, Tessa. Thank you, Asita. That's really great. And, and nice to hear something about the, the outcomes there and, and also a sort of giving some examples of the good practice principles that we've talked about. So I'm, I'm sure there will be questions um, late, later for you. Um, now I'd like to go over to Wales, um, to Simone Devinet from RHA. So we're going from a large project to a, a smaller organisation, but I think doing some really interesting things. So um, Simone, please, please tell us about uh, what you've been up to. Okay, um, well, thank you for having us. Um, so for for RHA, we you know we're a very small um, social landlord based in the valleys in South Wales. We only have around seventy staff, so you can imagine our programs are small and our resource and capacity is small. But you know, um, in terms of kind of the key things in in allowing or enabling social social justice and equality in our procurement, I would say. It, it seems pretty obvious that it has to come from the top, but you know, from our board and from our um, exec team, there's a real commitment and there are questions and they're always kind of probing for where, you know, kind of how are you, um, how are you evidencing this? How are you following up? How are you managing through uh, our contract review meetings, that kind of thing. So maybe around two years ago, because we're in Wales, we sit under an umbrella body for equality and diversity called Type How, but I don't know if other people on the, the, you know, the, the event today will be aware of them, but they have a quality mark in equality and diversity. So we decided that we wanted to work through this quality mark. So naturally, that um, brought our procurement process and practices into the spotlight there. Um, so as, as part of that, a kind of a change that we made to our uh, procurement process was not only having equality and diversity as part of the, the scoring, you know, through the tender process, but it was really putting it under the spotlight. So our equality and diversity champions who are trained um, specific, you know, of specific training and regular training, they were involved in designing the questions, designing the scoring, 
before the kind that you know the tender went out you'll have to excuse my um my vocabulary around these things you I'm not a procurement expert you know I come from the kind of community delivery quality diversity side but kind of that tender process you know we designed the questions we decide how we decided how the answers would be scored and weighted um, and then we work with our um, contract managers to ensure that in our contract review meetings, equality, and diversity, inclusion is on the agenda, is discussed. But we went further than that and we involved our tenants in interviewing our contractors um, through the tender process. And uh, some of the things that were important to them were also included in the tender process and the evaluation process. So, for example, they wanted our contractors to behave a certain way, to agree to a code of conduct and to sign up to something called Working with Compassion, which is um, a toolkit designed through the Samaritans. So we've, we've, we've really worked hard to make it real, you know, to make equality and diversity real in our procurement process. And, and for us, and we've just been talking about it this morning, actually, because we're exploring social value and again, how, you know, what's our understanding and how do we ensure that's embedded. If, if key staff in the organisation were to leave, our question is, is this a RHA where you're working or is it dependent on a person? And, you know, I think it's about embedding all of this, using the toolkit to make sure that at a strategic level and at a delivery level, these questions are being asked but not just ask, they are embedded in process and the right people are around the table at the time. So all of your stakeholders, not just contract managers. Um, so I, I kind of, I hope that makes sense. But 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 I think for us, the toolkit, we strategically, we can use it for those those bigger conversations, but, but in an operational way, I think it, it's going to be really useful for our delivery staff to be looking at, okay, how can we, you know, improve our processes? How can we make sure that um, everyone we work with is kind of, is, is following this process and using the toolkit? So we're really excited about, um, about the toolkit. And, you know, I think for us, there are areas that we're really strong and there are areas we can see improvement or we need improvement. So, um, yeah, we, we're really looking forward to seeing how the toolkit we can continue to, to help us to improve. But the commitment definitely comes from the top, the expectation. And I think it's just a case of then how you um how you embed that in all of your processes so the so that it's everybody's business. You know, it's not just the people in, in employed in kind of a procurement role, that equality and diversity and those opportunities in procurement are for everybody and we're accountable and they're everybody's responsibility. And that's the route there. We're not fully there, but that's the route that we going down I hope that I hope that helps <laughs> thanks Simone no that's great and, it, and it's really lovely to hear that you you know think the toolkit will be useful and and also to remind to remind us all that um you know despite some organizations being examples of good practice there's it, it always is a journey isn't there and there's always more that yes. to be done so, um, absolutely yeah um, unfortunately Simone needs to 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 go at some point so won't be here to um take questions but I think Simone you said you were happy uh, for if people have got kind of follow up questions um, to to get in touch with you at, at the RA. Yeah, abs absolutely. Will you share my details, or do you want me to pop them in the chat? If you could put your um, details in the chat, that'd be great. I'll do that now. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to go to uh, to Scotland. So it's lovely the way we're we're moving around um, the the nations here. Um, so Anita Jane Smith is. I know you've done tons of work at Glasgow City Region deal, Anita. So there's a lot that you, that you could say, but I think you're going to give us some sort of key highlights of the um, kind of equality related uh, good practice that you've been um, working on in in Glasgow, and uh, hopefully the toolkit will contribute to that. Yes, absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, thankfully. Sorry, I had some technical er um, issues earlier and I, I missed the introduction. So I hope I don't repeat um, what's been said. First of all, I would like to echo what um, Chris Oswald said. Um, I think, we've, you know, there's been many of us on this journey and it seems to be now over the seven year period and some of us are you know, I've moved around and some of us are, are still in the same role. I have been legacy officer now for the Glasgow City Region City Deal for over eight years. Um, again, I would echo what Chris said in terms of thanking um, Joe Mitchell from the Scottish Government and Barbara Morton 
um, and also Dorothy Balfour from North Lancashire Council, who's the chair of our procurement support group, um, because it really has been a collective um, effort. Uh, I would echo everything that everyone has said, and I think there's been some very valuable um, points raised, and you know, every uh, you know, it's, it's provided some very useful insights. I think the toolkit will be very useful um, in terms of, I find it just, um, you know, looking through it, it's user friendly, it is interactive, it contains lots of information and links, it seems very straightforward. Um, and I do believe that there's um, parts of that that can be used, um, taken and used elsewhere and replicated. And um, I think it's a very good product. Um, now that, that really does combine all that rich experience and, and knowledge um, over that seven year journey. Um, for myself, I, I don't want to repeat what has been said by some of the other panellists. Um, and obviously the case study for the Glasgow City Region City Deal kind of sets out our journey. But um, we were posed a question about the most important factor. Obviously, the golden thread is, you know, that's something that I've been working very hard alongside my colleagues, um, some of whom I've mentioned over the last eight years, uh, before we even started to use that terminology, um, trying to keep a line of sight between the local delivery and each of our eight local authorities who are partners with the city deal to the level to the national um, um, Scottish government um, work around procurement that's been underway now for um, well over 20 years and um, keeping that line of sight and moving into um you know thoughts about the golden thread and embedding that in in the the governance structures um our experience particularly in the at, at the deal is that practice informed policy and then we're updating practice in terms of operationalizing uh, improved policy that came about as a result of this bottom-up approach and then speakers um, made in terms of policy people don't always speak to procurement people and for the program and I think this echoes you know that program management approach of having a large program that we heard from from HS2 um, you know I, I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to be in that role um, connecting up through the policy and um, through the structure set um, you know set within the assurance framework and the program management toolkit in particular to um, implement that framework to, to be that like the operational practice and the policy to be able to write the procurement papers and also um, to ensure we put in place um, processes and systems and find you know the, the, the highest possible common denominator for delivery um, across all the elements particularly um, for equality um, I would just say most figures um, show that Glasgow City Region is overrepresented um, in the SND um, data zones for deprivation. Um, I'm just going to have to, my, my PC just chose that time to time out. Um, I think um, for Glasgow City Region, the latest figures show that across all domains, um, we, you know, we are. Um, Overrepresented, so um, Scotland's ten most deprived areas of the most deprived zones is Scotland eighteen point two percent within the Glasgow city region, um, and that's extended to the bottom fifty percent. Um, GCR's represent representation is sixty one percent, and um, we have we're overrepresented across the the domains for employment, income, education, and particular health, and we know that um, you know current challenges that are out with everybody's control affect the most vulnerable um, and, and in our society. So we've been working very hard. Um, I'm just going to skip now to the monitoring um, and pick up in the monitoring. Um, we have tried to weave you know, things throughout the programme management toolkit into the business cases, building the business cases, the design for projects, so on and so forth. But in reality, if you don't capture the information you don't know what's happening and um, you don't have the data to measure impact and you don't have the picture um, you can't um, intervene in a early intervention to make sure that your policies are targeting the people whom you intend intentionally target to if you don't then have the information and you don't have the systems in place you can't ask people the right questions at the right time to ensure you know 
that, that what you agreed within your contracts and your business cases is actually being delivered. Um, and I think that's very critical. Someone else mentioned about the um, the resource issue. So the most important factor is having someone within an organisation or for a, pro, a large programme who is going to serve in that role um, to bring all those stakeholders together to ensure that um, toolkits such as this one, the uptake, and it becomes you know truly embedded in the fabric of everything that we do. Um, and then we check that it is being done and we do um, suppliers and have that private sector engagement. Um, and we take on board what, what they tell us and to use it to improve what we're actually doing. But then once we've agreed what we want to be done, um, we, we do need to ask the questions and we do need to check it's been done and we do need to intervene so that we hold ourselves and others accountable. Um, I think that's all from me for the moment. Um, thank you and thanks for the thanks for the wonderful toolkit. I really do think it'll be useful. I'll be promoting it widely um, for bits to be borrowed, steeled and adapted. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Anita. That's really encouraging to hear that. And, um, and, and thanks for giving us a bit of an insight there. Um, so we're going to uh, come come back to uh, East London and, and ask um, Babu Bhattacharyji to talk a little bit about um, Poplar Harker and what you've been doing in the Housing Association there. Thanks, Babu. Thanks, Tessa. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear um, the insights so far from the panel. Um, I think from our side, um, we are... Um, quite a local organisation. So we only cover um, a square mile. We have 10,000 homes in that square mile. So we know the streets well, we know the communities well. And I guess um, our goal is around poverty and um, kind of basically eliminating poverty. Um, and it's something that we haven't been successful at. And to be honest, you know, it's 200 years of failure for Poplar. Um, and some people have been a lot less unsuccessful than we have. You know, we've had some great people working to try and change it, but we haven't managed to change it. So the key thing for me is having a long term approach. I think that it's a it, we need to understand that poverty is a really complex and stubborn problem um, and that we will need to commit all our resources to to dealing with it. And so whether that's around procurement, whether that's around direct delivery, we are spending a lot of money and a lot of our expertise uh, to work with the local community to improve employment, to reach sections of the community that, that aren't thriving. Um, and we're looking to do everything we can. So in that context, um, we need to, to, to bring our knowledge and our understanding of the problem to everything that we do and procurement is is a huge part of that and in this exercise i think what was what was helpful for us was was one to bring our expertise and our understanding of the issues and and use our community voice and the people that we work with and people we know um, to help shape what we wanted to get out of um, our contractors but then also to translate that into a language that our contractors could understand because i think you know we we're comfortable with a, a, a way of understanding the world and a way of seeing what we can do. And I think contractors aren't always at, in the same place or understanding the problems in the same way. So I think spending the time and, and gathering the expertise to make the procurement process work from a contractor perspective so that they can understand the, the challenge that they're being asked to, to address and that they also know the supports there, I think is really important. Um, I think. Interestingly, in terms of the toolkit, I mean, what we benefited from was the incredible expertise that there is around the procurement process. So whether they are um, the, the people that we bring in to help us with the um, process, um, the expertise around the room. So being able to use that to shape our offer um, has been really helpful. And I think that's what the, the toolkit will do for more and more people so that you don't you don't always need that level of expertise. You can use the toolkit to kind of give you um, the basic grounding in, in, in what can be done and also some great connections about other people who've done it. I think um, one of the key things for us is um, actually, yeah, we've all talked about this, haven't we? But this kind of thing about once you've procured, once you've set your tasks out, um, how you then um, monitor that, but also how you negotiate. I mean, what's been interesting for us around the Teviot state is the contracts coming back to us and saying, actually, 
I think we can deliver this in a different way, um, sometimes it's about circumstances, sometimes it's about finding better ways to do things. And I think being open to that conversation and having the mechanisms to be able to adjust, because what you don't want is a fixed set of rules, which then you realise for lots of good reasons you want to shift around. So you want to keep the, the kind of direction of travel, you want to keep the overall objectives, but within that you need the flexibility to be able to talk to people and kind of understand where, where you've got opportunities to make things even better. So I think for, for me, it is that long-term approach it is kind of um, recognizing uh, the potential for partnership and the potential to find different solutions to problems that um, have faced us for many years. So I think um, that's where I'll stop. <laughs> so thank you, Tessa. Thanks, Babu. That's great. And, and a good reminder about the importance of those uh, relationships with contractors and, and, and a, taking a long term approach. Um, I think that's really interesting. Um, so let's go to Abigail Hunt from the TUC to give us uh, your the view from your perspective, please, Abigail. Thanks, Tessa. Morning, everyone. Um, I'm Abigail. I'm uh, the policy, national policy lead uh, for procurement at the uh, Trades Union Congress. Our kind of entry point into the discussion about equalities in procurement um, is, uh, or mine at least, is, is through the public services lens. Um, We've got over 5.5 trade union members um, in the uh, public services sectors uh, across the country. Um, so that's uh, through TUC's um, affiliated uh, trade unions. Um, and here they span both um, public servants working in uh, public services, uh, local government, national government, and so on, uh, some of whom are involved in uh, overseeing procurement, uh, as well as um, a large share of uh, members, uh, working people uh, on the front line delivering um, outsourced public services um, who have uh, themselves um, had the, the terms of their uh, employment, their conditions they're working in, determined through the procurement process in some cases. So we really see um, procurement as critical for um, shaping quality work, good jobs, um, and helping as part of that to further uh, equalities. So where a procurement process is run with uh, social justice and equalities in mind, that can help to shape the everyday experiences of workers, pay um, and other kind of supportive measures that can help uh, redress historic uh, inequalities um, and, and further social justice. So for us, you know, procurement is an absolutely critical lever in that. Um, now, trade unions, um, it's not always that well known what trade unions do. Um, we work at a lot of different levels. Um, so if I can call it the kind of macro level, we work across policy. Um, so that's people like myself um, and national leads within unions um, working at all levels, for example, uh, with government. We've been working closely with the procurement bill, working with the cabinet office as they have elaborated um, uh, guidance in the past to accompany uh, procurement legislation and thinking about what kind of measures could be in there to promote um, equalities um, and good work. Um, and also kind of within the trade union movement at national level, there's been um, a real push towards taking proactive measures to um, to, to uh, propose how uh, procurement can um, support equalities. So, for example, the um, trade union movement have um, produced an anti-racism manifesto um, where um, it's highlighted uh, the, the, the role of the introduction of race equality requirements in public so sector contracts um, can help to address historic race inequalities. Um, and the trade union um, the trade unions have been involved in, for example, a national disability charter, again, um, which is um, calling for public sector contracts to take into account uh, potential of disabled people in the workforce of tendering organisations. So really kind of proactive proposals about what specific measures can be taken to um, further equalities. Um, we as unions have also been working with commissioning authorities directly at national and local levels to make sure that good work and equalities criteria have been um, included throughout the procurement processes. Um, so this is everything from um, trade unions uh, 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 developing employment charters of the kind that we've seen in the guide, um, which have uh, uh, good work criteria, living wage and so on, particularly for marginalised um, groups of outsourced workers, as well as specific qualities criteria, and then working with procurement teams to make sure that some of these criteria or the charters themselves have been included as a um, kind of a, a precondition in some cases of procurement. So essentially, where commissioning authorities have taken on board these good work frameworks um, and said to tendering organisations, look, you know, this is what we expect to see 
from you in terms of the workforce delivering these contracts um, and that is a part and parcel of the procurement process and the eventual um, contract which is really important and then unions have played a role in the workforce in making sure that where those commitments have been made under public contracts they are implemented uh, and enforced in practice so keeping an eye on where um, living wage where equalities commitments and others um, have 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 or have indeed not been um, fulfilled by employers uh, by the contracting organization um, and in some cases working directly with management to address some of those um, uh, emissions in other cases working with the contracting authorities to alert them to where some of these contraventions have taken place and then it might not be in the letter of word of the contract, but the work that unions and union reps in the workplaces do with individual workers is absolutely critical um, to achieving social justice in practice. So working with workers to understand experiences of discrimination, supporting workers throughout workplaces, uh, for example, Black Workers Leadership Programme or sexual harassment in the workplace training that unions um, have led and providing direct support to workers where um, unfortunately they may have experienced a direct discrimination um, um, in the workplace. So unions working at all levels. Um, and this toolkit, I think, is um, going to be a really helpful um, uh, piece of the toolbox, if you like, for that work across the board. A couple of things that when I read the toolkit really jumped out as, as me. And I, by the way, I've already shared it around all of our um, affiliated unions and, and I've already heard that some of them are passing it on to reps. It's a really practical tool. Um, the charters um, and some of the uh, manifestos that I talked about earlier, they talk about the what, but I think this toolkit really helps demystify um, the procurement process and put some meat on the bones of the how, concretely how, what are the entry points uh, for those seeking to um, support equalities in the workplace can work um, across the life cycle of a procurement process to do that. Um, so I think that's, that's really critical. I think procurement, um, is kind of understood to be a really important lever in securing social justice and equalities in the workplace, but it can feel quite scary. It can feel quite complicated and very formal for some in the workplace who don't really know how to engage. And for me, this toolkit goes a long way in spelling out all the steps and helping reps and union officials and others think about at what points could be strategic to engage. Um, the toolkit highlights the key role of collaboration and partnership working um, across different organisations um, in uh, securing qualities and social justice through procurement. Um, um, uh, for us, trade has a role in this, so I really like that that was um, uh, uh, brought to the fore in the toolkit. And then lastly, um, one of the things I really liked is that it takes a really long-term view. It, yes, it spells out all of the steps, but um, one of the phrases that I think was used was hardwiring hard social justice, even before a procurement um, for a specific project starts. And that's absolutely critical. And I think unions already have a long term view in procurement. Um, many unions work, for example, with um, elected uh, representatives, even when they're making their manifestos. And I think the fact that this toolkit really draws attention to that long term process um, is critical because sometimes it can be forgotten. Um, it can be tempting to focus on individual contracts without thinking of the link between the political directive, um, the policy directive, and then the practical um, how to do it that might be run through commissioning teams. Um, I mean, you know, an example of that is I always think a great one, and it speaks to the employment charters that were mentioned in the kit, um, is up in Greater Manchester. So Andy Burnham there, as part of his um, first um, election manifesto, said that he was going to, um, if elected, uh, put in place an employment charter and that was done uh, following many discussions with trade unions and then in his second manifesto he said right if I'm in again we're going to link at that charter which we put in place in my first term to procurement and then since that, that since then that's what's been done in Manchester so for me you know that really says that um, you know it's right from the beginning leadership matters but also right down to the commissioning teams and in the workplaces how some of these commitments done through um, public contracts are actually fulfilled um, in the workplace is critical and for us um, trade unions um, I hope can play a very constructive uh, role uh, at all of those stages. Thanks Abigail that's great and, and really interesting to hear about how trade unions can um, get involved at all those different levels but I think also that that you know that that's come out in in some of the research that we've done that the importance of trade unions kind of monitoring at that local level because they kind of know what's what's going on on the ground in organizations so um that was great to have that perspective thank you um so thank you all the panelists uh, it was really interesting to hear to hear your views and and the um encouragement for the for the use of the toolkit 
So we're going to take a short break now uh, to, to allow everybody to um, just have a quick rest as we've been on the call for a while. But do stay on the call and uh, come back and we'll have time for questions. So um, I make it 11.54. Shall we come back at five past 12? Um, and then we, we'll, we'll have our questions for the panellists. So in the meantime, do put your questions in the Q&A section um, up here and uh, I'll see you all in a moment. Hey, Hazel, uh, can you um, lead off with chairing the, the Q&A? Uh, yes, so we've been having quite a few questions and we've been trying to answer those that we could um, uh, in the, as we went along, but we do still have a few um, that need to be answered by our panellists. So um, the first question that we have is um, about tools and links to the tools. And I think Francis wants to answer that question. Francis, would you like to answer the question about um, where we find might find the tools, the tools that you mentioned in your presentation? Yeah, thanks, um, Hazel. There are a lot of links in the toolkit. And uh, we've also compiled some resources at the back of other things that we've all read and found useful, but haven't directly mentioned in the toolkit. So I hope you'll find them useful. But one thing I would mention is it's a work in progress. So if you find other things useful and could be so kind as to send it into the project team, there'll be version two undoubtedly that updates the links updates things that have you know maybe you've tried it and found worked well um and then i would just say the stat geostat that i mentioned is a new tool that um for any of you who've been involved in this kind of work and had to compile a a um kind of paper for colleagues on what are the diversity statistics to do with this particular project in this particular part of the country and found yourself trying to wade through uh, the ONS website for the latest census data on ethnicity in Birmingham, just for example, um, then there's some tools now available, Geostat being one of them that speed that up for you. They've done all the hard work, as I said, love to have had those 10, 20 years ago. But um, yeah, they've all got references to them in the toolkit. So have a play, see if you find them useful. And yeah, please send us more. Thanks, Hazel. Okay. Thanks. Do any of the other panellists want to add to um, sites of useful tools? No. OK, so we have a question um, about primary procurement legislation in Wales and um, uh, no longer having cost quality maximisation challenge, but a time cost quality environmental social economy economic cultural maximization challenge um uh all on par depending on the features of the procurement social matters no longer uh the added value so chris did you did you want to answer this question um no i'm, I'm not a welsh procurement expert by any means i think the comment which i, I put in was more just saying it, it's good to see that we're starting to move more to this kind of um, conditionality. But okay. no, it's an interesting point, but I don't know enough about the subject. To, okay, to... all right, sorry. Okay, so now we have um, a question um, uh, about Wales again, about supply chains and small businesses um, uh, and about the difficulty in um, imposing... Uh, procurement requirements on equality on small businesses. Um, it's quite a long question, so I won't read it all out. Do we have any um, panelists who would like to answer this? Uh, I can come in and um, uh, answer potentially only partially, um, based on our experience um, with the, 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 city, the city deal. So obviously we have a procurement support group that is um, made up of uh, procurement officers, specialists across the region. And I think that where there is a tier one supplier who has a supply chain of smaller businesses, then obviously the responsibility is with that tier one to ensure um, that what they allocate is proportionate throughout their um, supply chain. Um, however, fr from our uh, procurement knowledge hub, we know that um, 
but when you're looking at this, it's good to look at it on a case by case basis anyway and be proportionate for each and every contract. Um, so you, if I, I feel that um, if procurement officer time um, is tied up undertaking activities that could be um, delivered as part of roles and responsibilities assigned to other stakeholders in the overall process, then they have got the expertise and the experience to then look um, at um, how the contract is built on a case-by-case -case basis and potentially add in clauses that are proportionate to that particular contract that are going to deliver or make a contribution to the objectives, um, i.e. maybe seeing a, a reduction in something that you don't want to see, an increase in uh, behaviours that you do want to encourage, and then that information you would baseline at the beginning and then of a contract, and then you could capture at the end to measure the difference, even setting a target that is proportionate. And then it is mandated now, procurement experts could um, you maybe use different language, but for me, that's then mandated within the contract that these are become KPIs that you would be monitoring, but it's in the approach taken to that and it would be based on local priority um, at the time. But utilising that knowledge and expertise and experience of the procurement people rather than using their expertise in other areas of building a contract that others um, could, could be um, bringing their expertise to taking a more targeted approach across the board. I hope that at least answers some of the question. Yeah, thanks very much. Thanks very much. For that. Um, um, we also have um, an answer from Francis McAndrew, I think, to this, this question. Yeah, thanks, Hazel. I've got a few reflections on that, so bear with me. I think, obviously, I mentioned the consistency. So as public bodies, we could do a lot to help here by talking to each other about how we ask these kind of questions and what evidence we're requiring from small suppliers, especially to prove their EDI credentials, um, asking small businesses to start to collect or individual level monitoring data is unrealistic and probably uh, not that helpful. So, um, yeah, in terms of monitoring for equality, I think there's much more than just the diversity of the workforce or the diversity of the beneficiaries. Um, and as you'll all know, and it's in the question as well, there's a GDPR issue where uh, my golden rule, and uh, you'll be uh, probably alarmed to hear my other favourite subject is data, um, is never, ever collect or release that data. Well, collect it, but don't release it where there's less than 10 in any cohort. And if you're looking at ethnicity, gender, age, disability, etc., across your workforce, you can see how, you know, unless you've got a sizable workforce, it's really uh, tricky to, to collect it and it's certainly tricky to report it. Um, even on an aggregated level. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I would definitely caution ag against overly cumbersome requirements for small suppliers in the area of collecting individual data. But that is just to say, that's all a caveat to the point of we overcomplicate things with the language we use sometimes. And actually just having some really important conversations with the supplier in the contracting about what you're asking to be delivered so much more focusing on the what and the how and using um action plans on equality training plans on equality voluntary standards and audits and benchmarks and practices and actually you know the 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 end goal and often we fixate on this in edi diversity is is, is you know numbers the noah's ark two of everything actually there's a lot more to be done on how inclusive is an organisation? How fair is an organisation? How equitable is the organisation that you are procuring? How well is the contract delivered? Who's the community it's reaching? And I think those measures, when put into kind of everyday language for a small supplier about, as we said earlier, just delivering a quality project that delivers for the whole community, is much more of the kind of clauses I would put into to any experience. I just wanted to finally end with my own experience of being brought into a big business who'd suddenly issued a monitoring form to every member of staff. And it was a really clunky one and it wasn't very good and it had broken lots of data privacy issues. And I was asked to resolve the issue and trying to track it back to why are we doing this? Uh, what's it? Who, who wants to use it? No one knew, no one knew what it was for. And it came down to one of the big uh, commissioners had asked for it. And so I asked to speak to the commissioner about that form and they said they had no specific understanding of how it would be used, the data. So everyone had, you know, run around trying to provide this data, collect this data. And back to the questioner's point, unless you've got a plan to use it, golden roller data collection, another one, 
is you know you only collect it if you're going to use it um so i think um sometimes stating the blooming obvious but um yeah there's a whole other webinar on data collection there tessa okay thanks very much francis does that do any of the panelists so chris you want to um you want to come in on that one yes yeah, I mean, I completely agree with Francis that you shouldn't be collecting data unless you've got a plan to use it. That said, I don't think that it is um, beyond the means of subcontractors to provide this sort of information. Um, they will already most likely know the age, the postcode and the sex of the workers that they have. Um, other information like race is um, sensitive personal information, but again, it doesn't have to be disclosed. It can be disclosed confidentially to the contractor who can then aggregate up all of the subcontractors um, as an indicator of this. So I think, but absolutely, as Francis is saying, if people don't know why they're being asked these questions, they will not respond to them. And I've seen this many, many times where you know well-meaning monitoring um, regimes have been put in place, but nobody's told the person who's collecting the data or the person who's supplying the data why. Generally, people will supply the information, I think. Um, and I think that the enticement of revenue for solo subcontractors may overcome um, some of their reservations about supplying or asking for data. It's part of the contract, it's increasingly normal. Okay, Sita, I think you um, have your hand up to answer to uh, add an answer to this question. Yeah, thanks, Hazel. Um, I would concur with what Francis has said and also what Chris has said, um, perhaps by exemplifying what we've done at HS2. So we don't preclude any SMEs from uh, responding to our data requirements around their workforce numbers, particularly the diversity profile of their workforce numbers. But we do make it clear if those are below 50 in terms of their immediate workforce, we wouldn't obviously ask them to do that. But again, most of what they provide us is aggregate data. So we're not ne necessarily going to be able to identify the other individuals and no individuals with any linked data that we provide. So they will provide us the numbers in any given six month period of what their workforce profile looks like across ethnicity, across age, et cetera. Across, in fact, all the nine protected characteristics. Um, and ultimately, there's additional information they will provide us. So you imagine some of these SME within construction they form a large part of the workforce that we actually um, work with. It's not so much the tier ones, the tier ones act almost like a managing agent. So um, most of the contracts they have is subcontracted out to the subcontractors themselves. Um, and most, if not all, will, will be SMEs. So as long as you're in a position as the client or the organization to explain very clearly what the information you need, why you need it, and how will it be used, that initial education piece is quite key so that when you do gather the information, you do precisely what you say you're going to do with it. We've not had any issues whatsoever. So I think it's about the approach being right in terms of explanation of what you're doing, why you're doing it, and what the information will be used for, and taking those SMEs through the journey of the data. So we're playing that back. So after we collect the data, we do do a playback, looking at the dashboard and saying, actually, in this six month period, this is what the workforce looks like. These are where the gaps are, and this is what we need to do going forward. It helps to sort of tie in that full loop around the data you're collecting and how you're using that data. And so we start to really see where there's the sort of ebb and flow in terms of workforce um, diversity and where we need to sort of focus more attention to drive up the numbers where they are, where there's a shortfall in essence. Um, so I think from a data point of view, I think we need to do the job up front to enable the outcomes and the output you need. Okay, thank you very much, Asita. Does anybody else from the panel want to add to this? We do have another question, actually, on uh, the dreaded GDPR, um, a question around... Um, uh, uh, the living real, living real living wage, and how you report on that inequality. And I think Abigail wanted to uh, come in on that question. Abigail, thanks, Hazel. Um, yeah, so I'm not a GDPR expert, so I won't attempt to speak 
speak to the uh, specificities of that. Um, it was more about how we can manage and monitor equalities, um, real living wage and so on. Um, so I think quite an important thing for us on this is that, you know, um, employment um, conditions are really um, important for equalities, including in some ways that aren't always obvious. So we might have, you know, kind of a race equality um, or other kind of uh, quotas in the workplace in terms of employment. Absolutely. But for us, you know, when we look at women and BME workers uh, being um, a disproportionately large share of the outsourced uh, workforce, procurement can be a really important means of making sure that um, public contracts uh, further their equalities. So essentially, if you raise up the um, employment standards, uh, make sure that public contracts support secure work for these groups, you're raising the floor of their conditions and therefore supporting equalities. That's not always obvious, but for us, that's really critical. So um, when we look at the kind of criteria that you can bring in, uh, real living wage, absolutely a critical one. In some cases, um, commissioning authorities have uh, gone above and beyond real living wage. Um, which, of course, we're pleased to see, but things like um, not using zero hours contracts, which can lead to a lot of um, economic insecurity um, and uncertainty for, for these groups is critical. So where um, uh, uh, procurement has kind of worked to make sure that, you know, there's a wage, a good wage floor, non-use of zero hours contracts under, for workers under contract, etc. There's a lot of different ways that these can be monitored. Um, one is wage slips. That's kind of tried and tested. Um, so wage slips can be anonymized and sent to um, uh, contract management teams. Um, it, there it's pretty clear if there's an underpayment of, um, uh, of the agreed uh, real living wage, uh, particularly where the national minimum wage might be paid, but not that upset to the real living wage, it pretty quickly becomes clear. Um, but a really important thing about that is that it's important to have robust mechanisms for sampling those pay slips. They can be anonymized, which speaks to the um, GDPR issue, but it's important to have kind of uh, robust sampling so that employers where you've got um, workforces on different terms and conditions, they're not just sending those uh, pay slips and evidence of those on the, the better end of the scale. Um, so that's important. But again, uh, it would be remiss of me not to mention the role of trade unions here. Um, unions have gone into partnerships with commissioning authorities um, so that members um, have submitted their pay slips, particularly where they've um, not met the criteria um, or the agreed um, the contracted criteria of minimum uh, paying conditions. Um, and that's a really important way. Um, and just lastly, I think one thing that we hear a lot is missing and extremely challenging is for workers to be able to proactively um, report contraventions of their employment standards under public contracts to public bodies, commissioning authorities. Um, so in some cases, um, we hear that, you know, there's clearly a bit of a breach, there's a breach going on, but they don't know where to go. And commissioning teams haven't always been that accessible unless you've got these more formalized arrangements with trade unions in place. So in some cases, there may be, for example, in the deep depths of the council website an email to a commissioning team. Now, unless you're really quite dedicated, you might not find that email and it might be a very generic email. It might not get picked up. So that's a real challenge. So something that we um, have been calling for is um, strengthening partnerships with trade unions and others to get that um, information about what's going on on the ground, but also make it really um, easy for workers, uh, including those in non-unionised workplaces, to know where to go um, if those standards are not being met. Um, and that's everything from a kind of a standard reporting mechanism to have that line into contracting teams, uh, but also whistleblowing processes are really critical as well. And having processes where um, employees who have had their um, uh, rights uh, contravened under a public contract can do that in a safe way um, where, you know, they don't have to be fearful of their future employment prospects if they have uh, whistleblown against a particularly uh, egregious uh, employer. OK, thanks very much, Abigail. So, Anita, I think you wanted to come back on this question. Yeah, if I've got time, very quickly, um, I've just seen, yeah, I think the the role of the, the trade unions is, um, you know, both from from an individual employee perspective and also um, it's from a workforce perspective within the councils to ensure that they 
Um, it's really the only way of ensuring that what they say they're going to do, they're actually doing in practice themselves out with um, trying to influence and shape what happens within supply chains. For us um, in the city deal, we, we collect uh, anonymised data. Uh, we capture the barriers rather than the um, individual characteristics. Listening to private sector, there's lots of different ways that you can do that. Um, anonymised and a unique identifier, such as an employee reference number or a system reference number from the contractor as an employee that you can access. On that, I do think that there isn't any compliance checks beyond that um, to, to, um, to verify that that has actually been done. We certainly, we don't have any compliance teams that go out to, to, to do that further check on the, the evidence. Um, everything's integrated on our system. Uh, we've got a bespoke system that we are currently working, myself and Dorothy, who I believe is on the, the session, to integrate those questions to reduce the burden on suppliers, but to enable us to um, collect, the, uh, collect the information that we want to collect so that we can ensure that our interventions and our outcomes have been realised by the priority groups, many of whom, if not all of whom, have been targeted um, in terms of equalities. Um, and then we look at that information to inform whether there's an intervention for improvement in performance. Um, so, um, yeah, but I do think there's a, there is a role there for, for compliance um, as, to, to check that it's actually and verify what the information that we've been given. Okay, thanks very much, Anita. And uh, Asita, you wanted to um, uh, come in on this. I think I still had my hands up from the previous one. Ah, uh, the dreaded legacy hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think that's all of the questions now that we've got. Um, uh, do, do the, any of the panel want to add anything before I hand back to Tessa to close the session? No. Okay. Thank you. I'll hand back to Tessa now to uh, thank, give thanks. Okay. Thanks, Hazel, for for sharing that. Um, and and thank you very much um, to, for for the questions. I'm I'm sorry you didn't have a chance to hear from more of the participants, kind of in in person um but anyway i think we covered some interesting questions um so that so the final thing then is for me to thank the participants for um their huge contribution both today and and and, and throughout the project so it's been really great to have you all here and to have you kind of saying encouraging things about the toolkit and, and also sharing your experience so um that's been really great and, and i hope the participants have, have found that useful um so thank you to everybody and thank you to all the participants for coming um, I should say we will share the recording and uh, the, the slides and obviously the link to the toolkit, although I imagine many people have found that already, but we will share that with participants and, um, you know, feel free to share that more widely. Um, and we would like to keep in touch with people. We, I think a number of you are on our project mailing list, so we will keep in touch as things um, develop, you know, more further research outputs. Our, our research report will be available um, shortly, so we'll we'll let you know about that. Um, and um, as, as Francis said, really, there probably will be a version two of the toolkit. So with your kind of comments and, and feedback, um, this is unlikely to be the definitive version. Um, so we are really keen to kind of hear back from people who've used it um, about how you find it and, and um, any improvements you think that could be made. So um, would any of the other uh, team members like to uh, come in and say anything before we close? <clears throat> Hazel's waving. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I would just like to um, say what an amazing turnout we've had today. It's been um, really encouraging to see so many people interested in um, our toolkit and indeed on the issue of um, embedding equality, diversity and inclusion into the procurement process. So, yeah, it's really, really encouraging. Thank you. Joyce. Yeah, I'd just like to say, just to add to what Hazel said, but to encourage everyone also to do share that toolkit with as many people as you can in your networks. Spread the word for us. <laughs> Katerina. <laughs> yeah, I basically just wanted to thank everybody and say it was a really interesting journey to have this project and there's so much good experiences because um, I know we tend to talk about 
issues quite a bit, but I would really say the toolkit and also the case studies um, that we have will be hopefully really valuable just to also get some inspiration of what others are doing. Mm -hmm. And thank you for everybody who participated today and over the past few years. Thanks, Katerina. Yeah, and, and a good reminder that, yes, to, as well as looking at the toolkit, do have a look at the full versions of the of the case studies, because um, there's some, I think, some really interesting kind of examples and practice, which we point out in the toolkit, but there's more detail, um, yeah, on, on the... Uh, the full versions so um just thank you all really and um and particularly the the, the panelists so thank you a lot for coming and um, we'll stay in touch all right i'll stop the recording thank now you. okay bye-bye thank you bye-bye